Today is a message, as you're turning your Bibles, if you want to jump to Matthew chapter 5, today is a message, as I was sharing with the worship team as we were praying over the day today, um, to, today is a message, it's one of those that, um, as, as a pastor, I, I kind of think, where's the, where's, the, where's the high note to kind of leave you? Because today we're talking about mourning. Jesus says to the disciples, which is interesting, right? I mean, he's, he's gaining traction, he's gaining followers, he sits down on the side of a hill, everybody gathers in, presses in around him to hear what he has to say over the PA system. Thank you. He got there. Um, they didn't have a PA system back in that day, probably. Um, but everybody presses in, gathers around to hear Jesus, and, and he begins by Talk, saying what we talked about last week, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so therefore, we should walk in humility, right? That we want to experience the kingdom of heaven. We should walk in humility. We're talking about our desperate need for Jesus. And then the next one, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Um, to start us out this morning, I thought it would be good to kind of backtrack and talk about the Beatitudes just in general and what they mean. Is that all right? I hope so, because that's my plan. These spiritual traits of character uh, are known as the Beatitudes, and they're from the Latin word for happy or blessed, right? So we talked about last week that that word blessed literally means happy. It's the Greek word makairos. Okay, everybody say Makairos. Good job, good job. By the way, uh, happy St. Patty's Day. Am I allowed to say that in church? Okay, um, look at your neighbor. Okay, if they're wearing green, they're safe. Okay, now hear me. Hear, hear what I'm about to say very carefully. Look at your neighbor. If they're not wearing green and you know them, You're allowed to pinch them <laughs> in church. If they're not wearing green and you don't know them, introdu introduce yourself real quick, and then you can pinch them. Okay, we're going to have a little bit of fun this morning, all right? I am wearing green, back off. Okay, don't get excited. Right. What? I thought about it, but I guess that's green. <laughs> How would it not be green? It's green. Okay, very good, very good, very good. On the live stream, I'm glad that you're here. Okay, um, all right, back to this. Okay, the word makairos, which is translated blessed, means to be, okay, means to be. Now, now get this, so M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S, that's makairos, okay? All right, it, it, it means to be supremely blessed, fortunate, well-off, happy, Okay, according to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Barclay's Daily Study, William Barclay, a scholar, Daily Study Bible, gives a deeper look at this important word that leads into each one of these beatitudes, each one of these traits. Makairos, okay, this word blessed, this word happy, describes that joy which has its secret within itself, that joy which is serene and untouchable and self-contained, that joy which is completely independent of all of the chances and the changes of life. A constant joy. A constant joy. It is completely independent of all of the chances and changes of life. And he goes on to say the Christian blessedness, the Christian happiness, is completely untouchable. I love that. Okay? The Christian blessedness is completely untouchable. No one said, Jesus will take your joy from you. He refers to that in John 16, verse 22. The Beatitudes speak of that joy which seeks us through our pain. That joy which sorrow and loss and pain and grief are powerless to touch. That joy which shines through tears and which nothing in life or death can take away. The Beatitudes are comprised, each one of them, as we're going to talk through these, they're comprised of three elements. Okay? A pronouncement of blessing. We see all of them. Blessed are the 
poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And so a pronouncement of blessing. Then a quality of life. The meek, the mourn, the poor in spirit, the hunger and thirst for righteousness, the, the merciful, the pure in heart. And then a reason why the recipient should be considered blessed. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they shall be, our, our beatitude today, for they shall be comforted. Now, many of them, many of these beatitudes, okay, can seem counterintuitive. We talked about that last week. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I don't know about you, but I look at ours today. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Now we're going to dive into that, but that does, just at first glance, can we agree that that just seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? I've, I've mourned a, a few times in, in my life over, over things. I've walked family after family after family through, through grieving, and my first response is not to get in the car and think, wow, that was awesome. Right? Or man, I just, I just feel so happy after that experience. It's counterintuitive. And so as we look at these, they, we, we've got to own and we've got to uh, embrace, I believe, the, 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 the fact that these seem counterintuitive at first glance. Because how can someone who is mourning or being persecuted be blessed or happy? Well, the question we have to ask is, how can we achieve true happiness? How do we achieve, how do we accomplish, how do we get to true happiness? pure happiness. The average person living in a developed nation today enjoys a level, okay, a level. All right, I looked, I looked really deep into this, okay, but, but the average person living in a developed nation today enjoys a level of comfort and security unknown to those who lived in prior centuries, Okay. Compared to individuals living in poorer countries, people living in the more affluent nations have ex- access to a wealth of resources, utilities, Dunkin' Donuts, opportunities, conveniences, and services. Right? I was, we were in the Dominican Republic. I don't remember if I mentioned this last Sunday, but uh, as we were flying home from the Dominican Republic, we walked into the airport in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and I saw Starbucks and I felt comforted. I saw a Krispy Kreme and I felt even more comforted. But then I saw that their hot sign was not on. So then there was anger <laughs> that boiled up. Right? But we live with these, 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 these things, the wealth of resources, and all of these things that are at our fingertips. But has prosperity, have, has those things brought lasting peace and happiness into our world? No. No. They haven't. Feelings of frustration, emptiness, dissatisfaction, anxiety, all of these things run high in our world. And guess what? They're increasing. And so the question has to come that why do people who have so much feel so discontented? Why do people who have so much have such a need for more? Because along with seeking happiness, people want a peaceful life. Right? People want a peaceful life. And so this quest for peace and happiness and well-being fosters this so-called self-help movement, right? Where many people have been helped by adding exercise and relaxation and positive thinking and whatever yoga is to their lives. While others have found temporary excitement or relief in, 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 in other things that other helps or other uh, um, supplements or vitamins or whatever, right? But none of the self-help or, or, or drugs or alcohol or anything or other vices can tap into the source of real happiness. Can we agree with that this morning? At some point, they all end up leaving us feeling empty. 
So there's a spiritual component to happiness that's been overlooked by many people. Our Creator, God, provided an instruction book for life called the Bible, and God explains the dimension that's missing in the human knowledge and the spiritual element. See, Jesus founded the New Testament church on Himself and the Bible, God's Word. His teaching is a religion of love and of law. It has a spiritual component, the Holy Spirit, who is the presence and power of God. And so this Christianity that we talk about includes emotions, such as love, joy, concern for others. It includes rules, the law of God, and as explained by Jesus and the apostles. And in the Bible, we find that the ultimate goal of Christianity is not temporary happiness, but something much, much greater. The goal of an individual Christian, the goal of an individual follower of Jesus, is a transformation of the mind. Where we begin to look at these things and say, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Oh, that makes sense. To become a new creation who thinks and lives in the same way that Jesus did. I've been studying uh, discipleship and one uh, author uh, has recently uh, um, um, taken discipleship to literally mean being an apprentice. And so if we are disciples of Jesus, it means that we are literally apprentices of Jesus, doing exactly as Jesus did. Have you ever thought about that? Doing exactly as Jesus did. Now, we are humans, right? When someone shows us to do something, when, show, when someone shows us how to do something, we're, we're all, already thinking, right? This happens all the time, right? And maybe, you're, maybe you're like this, or maybe you're, maybe you're a better person than I am, okay? But, but, but when someone's explaining some, uh, the way to do something to you, how many of you just, don't raise your hands, please, because it'll, it'll make some people around you feel a certain way, potentially, okay? But how many of you, when someone's explaining how to do something to you, you're automatically thinking or, or just analyzing a better way? Right? There's a far better way to do this. There's a way more efficient way to do this. And so then you're given the reins of something and you begin doing it your way and it doesn't work. There's no worse feeling than that, is there? Because then that little glimmer of pride that you had that, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so much better, goes away. Right? And so this Christian life, right, is all about our dependence on Jesus and that Jesus explained these spiritual traits of character. My sermon just disappeared. Okay. Jesus explained these spiritual traits of character. Where's it at? Excuse me. Do, 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 do. Ha! Okay, I'm there. Where's that? Spiritual traits of character. Anyway, you get it, right? Oh, here it is. That produce, okay, Jesus explained these spiritual traits of character that produce a state of joy that persists apart from, uh, apart from any circumstance. Okay? That's never happened before. Okay? So, The second beatitude, let's get to that. For those who mourn, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus says that they'll be comforted. According to uh, Barnes' notes of the Bible, this is capable of two meanings. Either that those are blessed who are afflicted with the loss of friends or possessions, or that they who mourn over sin are blessed. Okay. Now, God is the God of all comfort. Can we agree? Okay, and he promises that someday all sorrow will be wiped away. 2 Corinthians 1, Revelation 21. So it goes with all the Beatitudes. Those who are meek, those who are humble will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Those who are merciful will attain mercy. Those who are pure in heart, they'll see God. Those who are peacemakers will be called sons of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake will inherit God's joyous and peaceful kingdom. And none of us can really feel the emptiness and the discontent that manifests itself as unhappiness in this world. 
Ultimately, that void is God's place to fill, and we can't meet it with something else, at least for any length of time. We can't generate a lasting joy, a lasting spiritual joy, nor can we find it some, uh, in, in some outside circumstance. We must acknowledge that the Creator is the source of all good things. That's our need for Jesus. And so the first beatitude that we talked about last week, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, we must first come to God in the deep poverty of our soul. As a man or woman who realizes how truly needy they are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in those words, we learn that the first aspect of being a disciple or apprentice is to be someone who recognizes their spiritual bankruptcy and therefore their need for God's grace. The second beatitude builds on the first. It teaches us that a true disciple starts off not only realizing how desperately needy they are. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm needy. Look back at the person that just told you they were needy and say, I know. (laughs) How desperately needy they are in sight of God because of their sin, but it also goes beyond that to express a deep sorrow and mourning over their sins. Right? Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so my question for you this morning that I want you to ponder for the rest of our couple hours together is this. Okay, let's start here. How many of you are sinners? Anybody? Wow. (laughs) Got to get that right, people. We're all sinners. Right? Paul tells the church at Rome, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? We're all sinners. The question is not if I sin, the question is when. Okay? And that goes for everyone. Pastor's not exempt from sin. Amen? Amen. Okay. Pastor's not exempt from sin. Which leads me to the question that I want you to ponder for the rest of our time together. When is the last time? It could have been this morning. It could have been last week. When is the last time your sin has grieved you? When was the last time your sin has bothered you? Isn't this awesome? It's raining. It's a gray Sunday morning, and we're talking about sin. (laughs) Couldn't get any better than this, right? Because here's because here's what we've done, and and I get why we've done it. And the truth, the truth is there. Okay, the truth is there. So hear my heart here. Okay, what what I believe we've done, maybe in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years of of church, of the Big C Church, is that is that is that what we've what we've tried to do is we've tried to make Jesus more appealing and comforting to people. And so we've lessened the blow. We've lessened the weight of the blow of sin, especially for new believers, so that they don't see God as someone who, who, who may or may not be let down by our sin, right? Because we don't want to picture that, right? That, that bothers us. That does something in us emotionally. And so, and so we've focused on the forgiveness and the grace of God. And listen, He is a forgiving God. He is a gracious God. He loves you. And He knew before He knit you together in your mother's womb the vices and the struggles that you are going to have with sin. Nothing that I'm about to say takes that away. But we should also, as believers in our maturity, feel the weight of sin. I'll never forget being 16, 17 years old and driving to the Outer Banks in North Carolina. And there's a stretch of road that is really long and straight, and it's two lanes. Okay, one lane going each direction. And the speed limit is an ungodly 45 miles an hour. And there was a day that we were going, and, and we were going out and back, and one day, because I had just got my driving license, 
And I had, I had a, that's a driver's license. That's North Carolinian for driver's license, okay? But I had just got my driver's license. And so we were, we were, we were me, me and a couple friends, we were going out to the Outer Banks. We were going to hang out at the beach for the day, which I didn't understand because I hated the beach at the time. But I was the driver, and so whatever, right? And so we're going, and, and we're coming back. And so we were in a bit of a rush, right? None of the, which the officer cared about any of this story. When he pulled me over, going 59 in that said 45 mile an hour zone, and I asked him, why is this only 45 miles an hour? And he said, because it is. That was a suitable answer, right? And, and I remember that, that was on the way to the beach. My day was wrecked, right? My day was wrecked. Not only because I had gotten caught doing something that he felt like was wrong, you see this? You see what I'm doing with my sin here, right? Not only because he, I had been caught doing something that he felt like was wrong and ignored all of these signs that said 45, right, and all of those things, right? But, but I had to go home and tell my parents that I had gotten a ticket. And so I'm thinking, right, well, 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 you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to soften this blow, right? How to soften the weight, right? Well, at least I'm not in jail like my other, you know, or something. Like, you know, I'm just trying, I was trying to figure out, right? I was trying to figure out a way, right? And, 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 and there were consequences, right? But, but it didn't mean that I never drove again, right? I still had the response. I still had to drive, right? I, I, and another story, right? You want to know how bad I was as a kid? All right, another story. I backed into my dad's really, really nice car while it was parked twice. <laughs> twice. Some of you are like, it's a really good thing I leave before you do on Sunday mornings. <laughs> right? Twice. And I, and I and I will never forget the first time I did it. It was kind of late at night, and I got home, and I had to tell my, tell my mom, because uh, I, I, I wasn't going to tell my dad. I wasn't going to wake up and tell my dad that information, right? And so I went to my mom's side of the bed, and I kind of tapped her really, really softly, and was like, I hit dad's car. Barked. And she just said, go to sleep. <laughs> Do not wake him. And by the time I woke up the next day, she had already told him, and he was out doing yard work to blow off the steam, right, of the anger that he was feeling for his son, whom he was still allowed to live in his house, which is gracious, right? But in both of those situations, in both of those circumstances, guess what? It was okay. My dad still loved me. He still cared for me. He still gave me food to eat on occasion, Right? The supply chain might have fell off a little bit, right? But there was still something there. But especially after I got that speeding ticket, guess what they looked at me and said? You're going to go get a job to pay for this speeding ticket. There was, a, there was a consequence. And so I went and got a job as a host at a Mexican restaurant where I got fried ice cream every night after I worked. And so the deal kind of worked out for me. It was awesome, right? It was a real blessing, okay? But, but we've, we've lessened in the church the weight of sin. We've lessened in the church the weight of sin by saying to ourselves and the people around us, it's okay. God's gracious. He's going to forgive you. Which again, is not wrong. That's true. But I believe in some circumstances, in some places, in some cases, what has happened as a result is that we have stopped feeling and become numb to the weight of that which grieves God, of that which grieves the heart of God, of that which He had to send His Son to the cross to die on behalf of because those things stand in the way of us and Him. Right? Sin clearly okay, is defined as things that separate us from God. Okay? And so God, who has done everything to make a way for us to be with Him, would no doubt be bothered by something that separates His children from Him. Amen? Amen. Think about that. Right? And therefore, it should 
grieve us. Now, it's, it's a catch, right? I get it. Because it, in no way can we, can we walk out of here this morning and say, well, I'm just going to stop sinning. You're setting yourself up for failure. That is not my goal this morning. Right? We can't do that. That's impossible for us this side of heaven. Right? But the point is, and the maturity that we have to get to, yes, calling ourselves to a higher level of maturity here, is that while, yes, God will forgive us, He will love us, He will care for us, He will be there with open arms when we decide to live, leave the pigsty and run back to the Father, He will come out and meet us. He will kill the fattened calf for us. He will do all of those things. But remember the posture of the son in that story, Luke 15, the prodigal son. He was amazed at the father's love for him. Why? Because he had become so sick of himself. Right? And so the question, again, that I want you to consider for the rest of our time together is when's the last time my sin has bothered me? Because it's not enough to simply recognize it in a merely intellectual way that I'm a bankrupt sinner before God. Because once I realize the poverty of my soul, I must also feel God's own grief and sorrow and pain for my sin. Did you hear that? It's not enough to have made a confession. I must also experience the contrition, the, 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 the payment, the, the, the desperation of the sin. And that sense of mourning over our sins is what the second beatitude is meant to instill in us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are bothered. Blessed are those who grieve, for they shall be comforted. I probably don't have to tell you. Uh, that such an idea as I've just described is contrary to almost everything we see in the world around us, right? The unbelieving world is very glad to embrace the sentimental idea that those who mourn in a general sense will be comforted, but certainly not if what they are mourning over is sin. But certainly not if what they're mourning over is sin. The people of this world structure their lives around ignoring and avoiding the whole idea of feeling bad about their sin. Right? We don't want to do that. Right? Much sin in our society is not grieved. It's not disapproved of. It's not merely tolerated. They laugh at sin and scoff at those who shun sin, calling them prudes or killjoys. Our society doesn't mourn sin. It mourns those who mourn sin. Let me say that again. Our society doesn't mourn sin. It mourns those who mourn sin. Sin. And please understand, it is not that God is against laughter and joy. It is not that God is against laughter and joy. Far from it. He is the original inventor of laughter and joy. Look at the person next to you. He created them. Don't laugh that hard, Chris. <laughs> going to give Tom a complex. He is the original inventor of laughter and joy. In fact, each of these beatitudes, each of these beatitudes begins with the announcement of eternal blessedness or happiness. And together, they all show us God's way of true blessing. No, God is not opposed to real laughter and joy. He's not opposed to that. He's not opposed to that. Instead, God is opposed to the shallow versions of laughter that divert us from real, eternal joy that Jesus said in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. But woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. The words of this Beatitude fall into two parts. right? An assertion that the mourners are blessed people. And second, a reason that they shall be comforted. So who are the mourners? Who are the mourners? I'm glad you asked. Okay? In Greek, there are nine words that express sorrow. Okay? In the Greek, there are nine words that express sorrow. But of the nine terms used for sorrow, the one used here is pentheo. Everybody say pentheo. Okay? P-E-N, pen, and then theo. Okay, T-H-E-O, right? And, and it means mourn. It's the strongest word in the Greek for mourning, 
Okay, it's the strongest word in the Greek for mourning. It's the most severe. It represents the deepest, most heartfelt grief and was generally reserved for grieving over the death of a loved one. This word is found 45 times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It describes, okay, now, now get this, you're, all right, none of these are going to be on the screen, but, but I want to read them to you because I think they're, they're fascinating to see the progression of mourning here, okay? It describes the mourning of Abraham for his wife Sarah in Genesis 23.2. Okay? It describes Jacob mourning for his son Joseph, whom he thought had been killed in Genesis 37. Samuel mourns over Saul and his failure to obey God in 1 Samuel 15 and 1 Samuel 16. David mourns for his son Absalom in 2 Samuel 13. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for good King Josiah at his death in 2 Chronicles 35. Figuratively, Jerusalem's gates mourn over the coming destruction in Isaiah 3. Several verses refer to the Land, the land of Israel, mourning over the sin of God's people. Jeremiah 23, uh, Hosea 4, Joel 1, all of those because of the curse. God's Messiah will come to comfort all who mourn, Isaiah 61 says. Daniel mourned over Israel's sin for three weeks, it says in Daniel chapter 10. Ezra mourns over the unfaithfulness of the exiles in marrying foreign women. In Ezra chapter 10, Nehemiah mourns over the great distress of the remnant who were back in Jerusalem. In Nehemiah 1, the people, who, the people weep and mourn upon the hearing of the words of the law. In Nehemiah 8, they were so stirred. Zechariah prophesies, he speaks of a time when the Lord will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn, Zechariah 12. So, although this word mourn can refer to grief and sorrow over death and other losses in this context, in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, in this context, it, per, it particularly refers to sorrow over sin. Like those who spoke in Zechariah, this mourning is the agonizing realization as we head into Easter. This morning is the agonizing realization that it was my sins that nailed to the cross Jesus, the Lord of glory. When I look upon the cross, we've got one right behind me, when I look upon the cross and truly understand the great price my sins cost my precious Savior, how can I feel anything about my sins but great mourning? Sorrow, deep remorse. If I'm truly a disciple or apprentice of the Son of God, how could I be indifferent or insensitive or hard-hearted to the great price of the sins that resulted in so much of his no, so much of his own suffering? So much of his own suffering. Jesus, in Luke 19, mourned over sin. Jesus approached the city of Jerusalem. He wept over it. Why did he weep over it? He wept over it because he had presented himself to Israel as the Messiah, and they rejected him. And that city and those who are going to be destroyed and devastated in God's judgment, Jesus' is mourning is over the sin and its effects in the lives of people. James 4, 8 and 9 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's nice. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And so what kind of mourning over sin does God bless? There's a Puritan. His name is Thomas Watson. And he points out several kinds of false mourning over sin. Because I think, I think in a lot of ways, sometimes we, we try to do this, but we do it in a false way. The first way that he points out is a despairing kind of mourning, right? Judas Iscariot, Matthew, uh, Matthew 27 is the example. He confessed his sin. He regretted it. He justified Jesus. He made restitution, but it was a mourning joined with despair. His was not repentance unto life, but rather unto death. Right? If our mourning just leads us to despair, because, because I don't know about you, but, but, but when I truly am lamenting, when I truly am broken over my sin, 
Yes, there is despair, but there is joy. His mercies are new every morning. Number two, there's a hypocritical morning. There's a hypocritical morning. King Saul in 1 Samuel said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. But Saul played the hypocrite in his morning. For he did not take shame to himself, but said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because the true mourner makes the worst of his sin. Saul labors to make the best of his sin. Third, and there's a forced mourning that's not true mourning over sin. Such was Cain's mourning in Genesis chapter 4 after he murdered his brother Abel. He mourned, and my punishment is greater than I can bear. His punishment troubled him more than his sin. Right? Have you ever said to your kids, are you upset because you did it, or are you just upset because you got caught? Because now you're in big trouble, mister, as Michelle used to say in Full House. And if you got that reference, I'm very proud of you. All right? His punishment troubled him more than his sin. To mourn only for the fear of hell is like a thief that weeps for the penalty rather than the offense. And then lastly, merely external mourning is fake. Merely just when you mourn externally is fake. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will talk about the fasting of the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear... To, to, to be fasting. Such was Ahab's mourning at the convicting words of Elijah when he says he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and laid in sackcloth and went about mourning in 1 Kings 21. His clothes were torn, but his heart was not broken. His clothes were torn, but his heart was not broken. We want to outwardly appear that we are a certain way when our heart inside is untouched. Right? Real mourning is a matter not merely of empty words or external actions. It's a condition of the heart before God. True mourning is spiritual. That is, when we mourn for sin more than the suffering it brings, David cried out in Psalm 51, my sin is always before me. So true mourning for sin confesses sins in particular. Judges 10 says this, The children of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We've sinned against you, because we've forsaken our God and served the Baals, the false gods. And so they mourned for their idolatry. All of this to say this, true mourning for sin is joined to a hatred for sin and a zeal for purity. True mourning for sin is joined to a hatred for sin and a zeal, a passion for purity. True mourning begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Get this, 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11 says this, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What, clean, what clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, true mourning for sin is constant. And so not only who are the mourners, but number two, why are they blessed? Why are they blessed? It says there, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Why are they blessed? First of all, understand that there's nothing of sentimentalism in Jesus' idea of comfort. These words, are meant, uh, uh, these words are not meant as a mere pat on the head, a mere condescending little there there to those who mourn. The Greek word translated comforted is a strong word as well, just like the one mourn. It's a compound word, parakaleo, and it basically means to call for or to invite someone to come alongside someone else. Love that. To invite someone to come alongside someone else. 
Figuratively, it means to exhort or to encourage someone, to comfort them, to console someone. It's related to the word used to describe the ministry of the Lord Jesus in 1 John chapter 2. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. It's related to the name given to the Holy Spirit. When he says, I, um, when Jesus says in John 14, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper. They shall be comforted. Right? This gracious promise comes from Jesus. Come to me in Matthew 11, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So in the ultimate sense, God comforts those who mourn and that He promises one day to glorify them in the kingdom of heaven when Jesus comes again. See, here's what we've got to get to when it comes to our sin. This is not our home. This is not our home. Many of us fall into the trap of striving to live as comfortably as we possibly can this side of heaven. It's not what we're called to. No, there's nothing wrong with some comforts. There's nothing wrong with some hot and now Krispy Kremes every now and then when the hot sign's on. Don't do it other than that because you'll be like, well, my pastor told me these were good, but they're cold. Don't do that to yourself. Okay, wait, wait till they're hot. Okay, please. Please. Which I'm not sure that really relates here anymore because we had a Krispy Kreme for about five minutes down in Saco and now it's gone. And so I think Maine is saying we make better donuts. Which might be true. What are we talking about? Oh right, morning. God comforts those who mourn and that He promises one day to glorify them in the kingdom of heaven when Jesus comes again. He will bring them. He will bring us into the state of sinless perfection. Isn't that awesome? That He Himself enjoys. And then to take them to live with Him forever in a new heaven and a new earth in which every trace of sin will forever be removed. We're told in the book of Revelation chapter 21, but there shall, be no, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And of those who live there with Him, we're told God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Truly then, those who mourn will indeed be comforted. Truly then, those who mourn will indeed be comforted. There's a day. There will be a day. There will be a day. Now, for, the, for those of you that might be sitting here and thinking, well, Pastor Travis, that's great and all. But you don't know the loss that I've experienced. Can I tell you the first experience of mourning I ever had? Is that Okay. It was July, and Kristen and I had um, recently gotten out of college and got into full-time ministry, and we were helping my parents move one day. And we had a small group of people. Uh, we had a small group that met at our house um, one night a week, and a lady in our small group, her name was Beth, she was pregnant, and her and John, her husband, they were, they were expecting their their first child, the next day. And uh, we got a call that she was experiencing some things, and so she went to the doctor for the last checkup before she was going to deliver the next day. And there was no heartbeat. Kathleen Joy Davis was that baby's name. And we were about two hours away, and my pastor, at the, t at the time I said my the real pastor, right? I was a pastor on staff, but I'm like, the real pastor's in New York City, and so I'll get there as soon as I can. And we drove the moving truck. We unloaded it as quickly as we could in my parents' new home, and then they, they, they um, 
kept our kids, and Kristen and I went up to the hospital. You remember that too? Yeah. It was a sad night. And um, walking into that hospital room and seeing Kathleen with her parents who were holding her for the only time they were ever going to be able to hold her. The only time they were ever going to be able to hold that baby. Grieved us. I remember walking out into the hallway to call the real pastor and telling him the, the status of the situation and how John and Beth were doing and some of the other family members that were there and just falling to pieces. I couldn't fall to pieces in the room, right? I'm supposed to be the strong one, right? And that Saturday... I don't, I don't remember. It might have, been, might have been like a week and a half later, but whatever. In, in, day, in, in recent days that followed, that was the first funeral I ever did. I did a wedding the same day, that morning. Which was, or no, the, the funeral was in the morning, the wedding was in the afternoon. And by the time I got to the wedding, I was so spent, I couldn't even eat cake. That's how, that's how you know you're really in a bad way. Right? But as I stood there that morning, and thankfully my dear, dear friend Brandon was doing the service with me, but I stood in a lectern just like this in a funeral home in Concord, North Carolina. And right before me was a table. And you know, going, going to school, you know, you, you imagine, right? Because it's part of the job that at some point you're going to do funerals. Right? You're going to do funerals. I've done, done many. I've done my father's. I've done... I've done, done many funerals where, 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 where caskets and, and boxes are in front of me or urns are in front of me and, and that type of thing. But the first funeral I ever did was a casket that was about this long, this wide, pink, for Kathleen. And that was the first time that I felt mourning a loss for words a, a hurting and an agony that I could not explain I kid you not I mean I'm kind of ashamed to tell this now I, I got up in that in that lectern that, that day I got up to that lectern with three books my buddy Brandon looked at me and said, what are you, what are you going to say? I said, I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm going to say. I've got these books, these resources that have all these like model services in them because I, I, I had no idea what to say. How do you explain this? And he looked at me and he said, Travis, and I've, I've used this so, so, so many times ever since Brandon looked at me and said, Travis, God's ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth are his thoughts than your thoughts. And he looked at me and he said, your job today is to not explain what happened or why it happened. Your job today is to love these people to Jesus. It was hard. Mourning is hard. It's hard. Now, I don't tell you that story to make you feel bad for me or that or 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 my, my first funeral. I'll tell you that story to let you know. In some way, shape, or form, we've probably all felt grief. We've all felt mourning, loss. I know because I'm, I'm looking out and I've, I've walked with some of you through yours. You've walked with some of us, my family, through ours in 2017, right? Um, and in the same way that we feel loss over a loved one, a dear friend, and we mourn that, and it feels like 
Like one of the, one of the, one of the things that 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 I've I've felt about death is that it's so permanent, right? Like you never really think about that going into it, but then but then on the other side, it's like, man, I'll never see them again this side of heaven. Like it's so permanent here, this side of heaven, right? Thank God for the hope and promise of a future, right? But in the same way that we feel that hurt, that longing, that loss, Jesus is relating that to how we should feel about our sin. That longing for Jesus, that loss for words, that grieving over why can't I just do gooder? Right? Why can't I just kick this? Why can't I just stop this? Because you can't. Without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my prayer for you today is this, that God would give you a grieving, a mourning, over the thing that separates you from Him. As heavy a grieving, as heavy a mourning as you've ever felt. Because that's what He intends with this verse. That's what He intends with this verse. And hear me, I'm not trying to be sensitive to your loss. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be insensitive to your loss or anything like that. I'm saying that our sin that separates us from Jesus is so deep. But look at the promise. I'll end here. We're going to scratch the rest of the sermon because I think this is a good place to end, don't you? Not because it's 1110. Because y'all know I don't care about that stuff. But I believe this is where God would have us end. Blessed, happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who weep and grieve over the thing that separates them from God. For they shall be comforted. Jesus literally promises, come on worship team, Jesus literally promises, as we looked at that word, to come alongside of those who grieve their sin. He promises to come alongside of those to comfort, to pick up, to, 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 to wipe off, to dust off, to clean off, to brush off, right? Those who weep and mourn over their sin. Why? Because He's the ultimate comforter. He's the ultimate comforter. Now, have you ever been comforted by someone that just didn't know what to say and didn't know how to comfort and so they actually really offended? Those are the best. Right? Those are the best. Those are the best. There were so many people in 2017 when my dad passed away, right? And they, would, they, they came up to me and there were, there were so many people that just had no idea what to say. And so let me give you just a little pastoral tip. If you don't know what to say, just don't say anything. Like just say, sorry for your loss and move on. Like you don't have to say anything else, okay? It's all good, Okay. Jesus is the ultimate comforter who knows exactly how to care for you. But in that moment, in the moment of comfort, it may not feel like comfort. You may not think that it's the best thing to hear in that moment, but it's the thing you need to hear. It's the thing you need to hear. It's the thing you need to hear. And so Jesus may be telling you something today that you say, oh, but I don't want to hear that. But you need to hear that. I was reminded the other day, I was with someone, and we were praying together, and I said, you know, this Sunday I'm preaching on mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. And I was kind of sharing about how it's, it's a tough one, right? It's not, something, it's not one that you get excited about coming and preaching. Sin. focusing on that. And he looked at me and he was reminding me of the passage in Ecclesiastes. There's a time for everything. There's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. 
There's a time to mourn. There's a time for comfort. Ecclesiastes 3, go read it today. There's a time for everything. And I believe the time is now, church, for us to pray this prayer before God. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Because what we're praying there is, God, break my heart over the sin that separates me from you and therefore breaks your heart. Grieve me over the sin. Gag me, as Jesus says in Revelation 3, right when he's talking about the lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold, so I want to spit you out of my mouth. The, 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 the translation there is that Jesus was literally gagged over the church that couldn't make up their mind and they were trying to sit on both sides of the fence or, or balance, like I've shown you before, between the latter. Right? He's saying, just, just choose, right? Be hot, be cold, but don't be in the middle. Right? That God would break our hearts for the things that grieve His. And as the worship team is going to play a song, they're going to sing a song called, Oh, Come to the Altar. I'm going to pray for us. They're going to sing. And while I'm praying, we're going to have some folks that are going to be up front. Okay? We're going to have some folks that are going to be up front, right? We're going to have some folks. I hope we're going to have some folks. We are now. We're going to have some folks. They're going to be up front. And if you'd, if you'd say, hey, this, this morning, I would, just, I would just like someone to pray with me. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them your sin. Okay? But it will be a sinner praying for a sinner. That God would break your heart for what breaks His in your life. But if you'd say, man, I just, I just want somebody to pray with me today. That prayer. Then we invite you to come. As the music's playing, somebody will receive you. I'll be right down front if you want me to pray with you. I'd love to. But let's take the opportunity that before we leave, because we don't want to walk out of here the same way we walked in, right? Before we walk out of here, let's pray that prayer. God, begin a process in me where I'm more bothered by the weight of my sin than I ever have been. Mature me to see the impact that this has in my relationship with you. And give me the strength to squash it. So God, this morning, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And God, I pray that we would mourn the things that stand in between us and you. God, that we would mourn the sin that has stood in the way of us being a good husband, wife, parent, son, daughter, co-worker, boss, employee, church member, pastor, leader, community member, coach. God, I pray for each and every one of us this morning that you'd break our hearts for what breaks yours. God, that we would see your grace in us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And there's the hope, right? That God, you sent your Son to fill this void that we could not fill. To mend the brokenness that we couldn't mend. And so God, today, as, as I believe you want us to feel the weight, you literally say to mourn over the weight of our sin, God, you also have paid the debt. And so we thank you. We thank you that we can be called sons and daughters of you because of your love for us. And so God, as we sing this morning, I pray that you would continue to do a work in us that you've started today. In Jesus' name, amen.